just start it on the thing. So I know. Okay. So my name is Arden Dahl, and for my research this semester, I decided to look into abstract art and divergent thinking. This is just my content table. Quick question before we get into it. So here's a selected group of students, 5, 10, 15, and 25 years old. Do you think divergent thinking goes up or down with age? And just throw yes or no in the comments. I'll give you a few seconds. Where are my comments? The box disappeared, there it is. Now I see it. Okay, so most of you say it's going up. Yeah? Okay, now it's starting to get a little mixed. It actually goes down and significantly with age, so this study done concluded in 1992 by George Land and Beth Jarman took the same age, the same people over a span of their lifetime going from 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. And they found out that kindergartners had 90% of uh, divergent thinking. So that's pretty above average. But by the time they were in fifth grade, that had dropped to 30%. And by the time that they are adults, it is 2%. So I got into the idea about abstract art during the summer when I had an art history modern and there was a lot of good fun abstract art. And uh, I wanted to know what can abstract art do for people? What was making it do for you or viewing it? And uh, I wanted to experiment myself. So here's two journal entries I did during our time. And quote, there'll be two quotes, so they, they will conflict and that's to make you think. The first quote, all art is abstract, but art is an abstraction of the truth by Milford Zorins. I started with a decent amount of research that was completely theory-based, uh, and this is one of them. And this is looking at the early abstract artists and the gestalt psychologists. So some of the, the gestalt artists, uh, Kandinsky, and uh, then we have the experimental psychologists, Edgar Rubens, Lips and Warth Minor. Anyway, I messed that up. But the artists, the De Stelt artists, were actually testing out Rubens' theory. So they were reading this and testing out within their art. And see, that just made me realize, man, the possibility of taking psychology, cognitive research, and art and having it all in one research really opened my understanding of what research could be. This study done by the Museum of Contemporary Art was what I based a lot of my framework on for what you will find out what I propose in the following slides. Now, they had a four-step program. It was a longitudinal study where they had workshops, field trips that were facilitated towards a culmination exhibition, and then they had free family passes. Now, their goal was to better their relationship with the community, and they had 30 students within this study. But <laughs> my goal is, what can abstract art do, and could it better divergent thinking? So this is the timeline I got for this. Uh, I'm going to present, propose a study. I'm going to give you a timeline in the first part. Next, I'll give you a methodology and framework. Uh, third, I will give you study goals. 
And then fourth, I will lay out some components of what I think should be in the lessons. The study timeline. I want this to be a longitudinal study. I think that's the best way to really see any significant growth. So the duration should be four to six months. In the beginning of the study, before they start the workshop or before they go and do any facilitated uh, tours in any museums, I want them to do a divergent test, which basically means um, an example of a test would be, ah, uh, here's a paper clip how many uses can you come up with that? And maybe some people will come up with five. People who are really good at this will come up with a hundred or so. And they'll do it by thinking, well, does it have to be a paperclip the way we know it? Could it be a bridge? Could it be as big as a bridge? <laughs> so that's one. We're gonna need that for a baseline. And then uh, VTS, which means visual thinking strategies interview where you show them some abstract art and get an understanding of where they are, how they think about abstract art, how they interpret it and judge it. And then they're gonna go into the actual workshop, the tours, making their own art and exhibition. And finally, after that, they will have another divergent test and then an exit interview. <clears throat> which I just explained that. Now the idea is that this will be a baseline score, the first test. And after they go through the study, hopefully the revised score is significantly higher. That will give me the, uh, the correlation that teaching abstract art can increase or strengthen divergent thinking. And here we go, we got, going to the museum and facilitate tour first to get them to have a BTS conversation with the art in person, that's pretty important. And then they're gonna work on a workshop and come up with their own designs through certain lessons and another museum to give them some more inspiration and then an exhibition. Now the lessons, the key components I need I think will do the best will be generation. They need to generate ideas, composition, many compositions, not just two or five, 40. High number, because that's when you get the novel idea. It's not after the 10th idea, it's after the 20th or 30th. And then experimentation with mediums, which will make that number even bigger. And so, one idea is that they create compositions by cutting magazine up. Then they take a picture of that. Then they do thumbnails where they'll draw them out and experiment with the mediums. So they'll make 50. So they're going to make 10 extra just based on using different mediums within the thumbnails they already did. And then a final artwork. The goal is that divergent thinking is receding due to education and I want to know if there is a connection between making abstract art and divergent thinking, because divergent thinking is essentially being able to come up with numerous answers, numerous ways to question something, how to phrase that question. It's, it's more than one. So it's the opposite of convergent thinking, which is there is one way, there is one answer. And why I think abstract art would help this is because it doesn't have one answer. Abstract art doesn't have one way of making something. It doesn't have one way of one type of art either. <laughs> there are many different divisions of abstract art. And so I think the correlation might be there if the study is done. The last quote, we have to have a Picasso quote, is there is no abstract art. You must always start with something. Afterwards, you can remove all traces of reality. And thank you for coming and thank you for listening to my proposal. Here's some of my resources. Wonderful, awesome. I love this really well thought out um, study design and giving us all the like the reasoning behind it. 
so it's like, you know, you really could see like, okay, here's this thought that I had and here's how I could um, put it all together. Um, I have to just say the one thing that just popped out to me, like my initial reaction is like, wait, what do you mean? Like have them do 40 things? Like did other people have that? Like, oh my God, 40, that's like so much, right? But then I, then I also think of like, well, but yeah, it's like, you have to do that many to really get to the novel, the novelty of it and to really expand the notion of what could be possible. And um, it just made me think like, wow, do we really like, I don't want to say like we skate by with like just enough, but it's like, wow, we are just like barely scratching the surface of what's possible, right? Like by just, you know, kind of doing our well, stuff. Exactly. And that's what I wanted to nail in with the study. I don't think I went into that as far, but basically the study shows that divergent thinking is not, is completely diminished through education. It's not a primary goal within education to advance and strengthen divergent thinking. And that's part of a problem. If we don't have people who think divergently, who can come up with these really novel or advanced ideas, then we wouldn't have pe penicillin, you know? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't, we'd still be using wooden boats, mm -hmm. you know? Don't fix if it's not broken. Well, yeah, you always want to fix something and make it better. And you want something that no one ever thought of, and that's that's what we need. You know, and it's interesting because, and I can share with our our guests in that one thing that we've kind of followed a little bit or we used as a, a real life example all year was what, like looking at the vaccines, right? So like the research and studying for the vaccines and how interesting, right? That like, wow, like everyone is kind of surprised that they happen so quickly. But part of it is because the mechanism right? This idea of the messenger RNA and like this mechanism of how they are getting the antibodies to, you know, be in our systems is really, it's not what people were expecting, right? So like this idea of divergent thinking, it's like, if you look at all of the, you know, experts that have been interviewed and I've read lots and lots of things about it, it's like, oh yeah, wow, that makes sense. But it's, it's not the way everyone was thinking that things were going to go. So it's like, when we, we talk a lot about that interplay between creativity and science and how necessary it is. And you really bring up a great way of looking at how can we look at that. Um, does anyone else have any other questions or comments for Arden? Yeah, um, I think, so me and Arden started the program at the same time last semester. And I'd say that over the course of the year, um, getting to know you, I would definitely describe you as an analytical person. And I think that that really came through in your presentation. And I was really impressed by the fact that you designed like a whole study. Um, I think that was really cool. And I'm interested to know, once we get out in the field and have experience, do you think that doing that study is something you'll be interested in? Um. I've never really thought about doing research personally. Like it's something I've always actually tried to stay away from. <laughs> but uh, I would like to see the results. I would like to see this study done. It doesn't necessarily have to be by me, but if I was heading it, I do have an understanding of like what I'm hoping to see, what what the goal is. And maybe and to be honest, I might have a goal in mind, but that might not be what I get from the research, what happens. And that can be interesting as well. Like maybe it's not as cut and dry as I'm thinking currently, but the hypothesis is to test that out. So I have to just interject that, that you make me a very proud research teacher, right? With that comment, right? Cause y'all are kind of snickering, right? Of like that idea that what we think we're gonna get isn't what we always end up with, right? Because it's like, we want to go in with that idea because we, if we go in and saying, okay, this is what the end result is going to be, then what's the point of doing the research, right? So it's like, this is that way of, of looking at that research. Um, but another thing that I want to just kind of put out there for everyone is that part of why we do this and we take this time to look at these ideas and develop them over the course of the semester is that what are we going to do next with it? And this goes for everybody of that your projects, your ideas, and so the next step that everyone in the class is doing is submitting a paper, submitting a manuscript. 
And so that manuscript could actually be submitted to a journal. And it, remember, it's like, you don't actually have to do the research yourself, but these different ideas that you guys have already put forth could be submitted and say, hey, someone that has the research or if someone wanted to do a grant proposal or something like that, you can just have the idea. You don't have to be the one to, to actually do the research. So planting the seeds for the future. So, um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Next, yes, next up we have Megan. <laughs> 